here's the uh, statistics shown in graphical form. So what I show here is, don't go all, all the way back to 1 AD, but from 1700 on to 2000, here are statistics for GDP. She use a symbol P here. Inflation adjusted world GDP. It's a green line. And you can see there have been bursts around 1880 and 1950. And today, the GDP is about 100 times larger than it was in 1970. Now, the time integral of GDP, the total wealth, we could call it that, is, of course, I mean, mathematically, it has to be a smoother, more slowly varying function because it's determined as much by the past as the present. And that is increased by about a factor of six or seven from 1700. I think it's about, what, $300 trillion or something? About $300 trillion in, 19, in 1700, and today it's about $1,600. $1,700 trillion, $1,990. And then we have the statistics for energy consumption, which is this red line. And what I've done is blow this up here, and this is wealth in dollars, and this is energy consumption, and you can see that they're pretty much growing in tandem. So that the, const, the relationship, you divide one by the other, and you get more or less a constant line. And in fact, this line is actually becoming more and more stable as, as we go on in time, perhaps because the uh, statistics are just better. There's, economists don't seem to provide uncertainty limits on their calculations, estimates of GDP. In fact, GDP, global GDP, goes out to, I think, 10 significant digits or 9 significant digits, and what you get from the UN, which is a bit odd, with no uncertainty limits. So, <laughs> I mean, I don't know what the uncertainty is here in their calculations, but nonetheless, it seems to be converging on something fairly stable. So that's encouraging. It suggests the hypothesis is correct that fundamentally money is power. So now to move on to uh, CO2 emissions, I think that makes for a very simple calculation for how emissions is related to wealth. So what we have here, this is the value of civilization, which today is about $1,700 trillion, $1,990. This is that constant I mentioned, which is 9.7 milliwatts per $1990. Doesn't seem to be changing with time. And this is the carbonization of the energy supply. So we have, people say we have a fossil fuel economy fundamentally. So this is just a representation of the relationship between um, energy consumption and carbon dioxide emissions through just this simple equation right here. Energy consumption times carbonization gives you the carbon dioxide emissions rates. And you can see from this equation that emissions rates are really just fundamentally linked to the wealth of civilization. Barring a change in carbonization, and carbonization hasn't been changing at all recently. I mean, it's just, I think the time scale for carbonization change is about 300 years right now. So these two things are fundamentally linked. You cannot reduce emissions rates without reducing the wealth of civilization. That's, it's, just, it's just a fundamental relationship because wealth is energy consumption. Energy consumption is carbon dioxide emissions. The two are inseparable, which means that we cannot decouple wealth from carbon dioxide emissions without um, turning away from a fossil fuel economy. There are simply no other options, period. And as it turns out, if you want to at least stabilize carbon dioxide emissions, um, you would have to decarbonize as fast as the current growth rate in energy consumption, which works out to about one nuclear power plant per day. So that's what would have to be built globally. I mean, it doesn't have to be nuclear power, but it has to be some non-CO2 emitting power supply. So to compare them, I mean, this isn't the approach that's normally portrayed in, uh, say, the IPCC framework. In the IPCC framework, they have a rather more complex approach. They have very sophisticated and complex uh, societal models that are based on trends in things like population, prosperity, which is the GDP per population, energy efficiency, which is the energy required to produce a dollar of GDP, and the carbonization. And in the model I discuss, it's just wealth and carbonization. All these things are implicitly folded in to wealth. So it's not that they aren't part of the whole thing, but they are implicit and one really only has to know these two things. And as I was later discuss, really this one is just a function of energy efficiency. And we'll, I'll get into this later. So it's, a, it's basically it's a much simpler way 
of looking at the human system, treating it as an entire organism where the monetary wealth is related to something that's physical, which is energy consumption. So I think it brings up the question of what is the future? Um, can, if we have a more simple uh, way of portraying things, can we make forecasts in the future that are perhaps more constrained? Now, I should say here that there are very fundamental thermodynamic arguments, I think, why you cannot predict the future. You can only know what you know based on what we have seen from the past. And based on what we have seen from the past, we can make an estimate of what the future is going to be. But there are things that are fundamentally unknowable to us that could have an impact on the future. I mean, perhaps there's some, you know, I don't know, asteroid that impacts the Earth that we just don't catch and comes in. I mean, we just can't predict those sorts of things. There are aspects of the future that we cannot predict. But, you know, I mean, I think you can perhaps say that this might be at least a more constrained question of how will wealth grow? And in that regard, um, I think, you know, we could do something that's perhaps a little simple. This is just, just a little, I'm not sure that there's a whole lot of physical basis for this. There might be, it's kind of a fun graph though. But all I did, this actually got me a little bit interested in the problem. I still can't really quite explain this plot. But if you look at atmospheric CO2 concentration, in parts per million by volume, and compare that with the world GDP on the log log plot. Um, these are statistics for CO2 concentration from various sources, including ice cores, going back to 2 AD. And you plot that against the world GDP, and it's you know, pretty much a straight line on the log log plot. Um, the perturbation of carbon dioxide concentrations seems to go as a square root of GDP. I don't know why, but you know, that maybe this is just coincidence. And I'm, you know, fundamentally, I'm trying to compare things to wealth anyway, which is the time integral of GDP. And maybe there is some underlying thing that's governing both of these properties. But at the very least, it suggests that, well, you know, if we want to reduce CO2, you know, something has to collapse. Um, and in fact, rather more, even more uh, amusing way of looking at this is that this to switch around the graph and look at it in more recent years. Um, here's GDP plotted against atmospheric CO2. And there's you know, a very, very tight relationship between the two. And it's uh, $407 billion per year per part per million CO2, um, which suggests that you could just go to the top of Mauna Loa with a CO2 monitor and measure the size of the global economy to a high degree of accuracy. And anyway, it's just fun. But I mean, more, more seriously, I mean, this is really what the model is. It's a dynamic model that, um, it can be, whenever you have a time integral, you can express it as a differential equation, some couple differential equations. And that rather than show you the differential equations, I'm just expressing this in a sort of a pictorial framework. So really what we have here is we have wealth. Wealth produces GDP, inflation adjusted, which then adds to wealth. So this was that integral part I was showing to you. But you know, what's implicit in that is that GDP adds to wealth. So I, this is a bit like to, with a particular rate of return. And as I show in the paper, that this is fundamentally related to the energy efficiency of the system. I'll discuss that in a second. But let's say you put money in the bank. You can expect a rate of return above inflation, perhaps. So that's the rate of return above inflation that produces your real production. And that adds to your wealth which then, you know, this is just compound interest. That's, that's all this is expressing right here. The main result here is that this cycle of compound interest is fundamentally linked to physics through this parameter lambda that I discussed earlier, this 9.7 milliwatts per inflation adjusted dollar. So that wealth is a representation of energy consumption rates. GDP, real GDP, is a representation of the growth in energy consumption rates. So GDP is just an abstract representation of our capacity to increase our capacity, our ability to increase our capacity to consume more energy in the future. That's what the production really represents. And so there's the same rate of return here as there is here. These are just identical um, loops related only through a constant. So just multiply this by this. And then of course, the nice thing about this is that while energy consumption is related to CO2 emissions through a very simple relationship, it's combustion leads to CO2. So this is a, you know, just we can relate the two very easily now between wealth and CO2 emissions. 
And you know, to perhaps explain this, I think we can, this is very intuitive because here's a picture of my son as a three-year-old and here he's eating apples off the tree and uh, you know, he eats, takes the potential energy and carbohydrates and incorporates the nutrients, the material is in the nutrients into his body which enables him to consume more in the future. And you know, as he's eating one apple, he's reaching out for the other. There's a positive feedback loop there that leads to him eating far more today as a six-year-old than he did as a three-year-old. And you know, this is throughout nature. This is, a, talk about a tree doing you know, the same thing. It takes a, through photosynthesis, it uh, takes a potential energy in available sunlight to incorporate nutrients from the soil and from the air in order to grow. And as it grows, it is able to do that more in the future. And with either of these cases, um, things like, you could think of this being done with a certain degree of efficiency. And the efficiency in this case could be positive or negative. If this thing is done efficiently, then the system will grow faster. It will be able to incorporate the nutrients efficiently and then grow and then consume more in the future. If it's perhaps diseased, then uh, the, well, the plant here might die, and then the efficiency would be negative. And then you would have, rather than exponential increase, an exponential decay. Because even though it is incorporating nutrients, it cannot offset some environmental predation due to, let's say, a disease. So we have an efficiency there, and if the efficiency is positive or is higher, the system will grow faster. Works too for a snowflake. If this is my own area or a droplet, I can write down the equations for this. Um, in the case of a snowflake or a droplet, the snowflake or droplet grows due to a potential gradient in supersaturation. Uh, the, uh, the potential energy associated with uh, high vapor, higher vapor concentration far from the snowflake or droplet compared to the surface. And that drives a gradient of water vapor to the snowflake that enables it to grow, that increases its boundaries with its surroundings, that then enables it to grow even faster. And here the efficiency of the system is fundamentally determined by things like the diffusivity of water vapor and air. And anyway, we could apply this to civilization. And this is actually a, a phenomenon that's been addressed before, which is that if we increase energy efficiency, it leads to accelerated growth and more energy consumption. I mean, I think we are quite familiar with the system. We get an energy efficient, energy efficient fridge. And well, you know, we can have two energy efficiency fridges now and use one to store the beer in the basement. And you know, it's cheaper to run now. And you know, we end up consuming more energy rather than less. And this is actually something known as Jevons' paradox that was first raised in uh, 1865. And Jevons, I mean, he's, he's kind of a neat guy. He uh, took life way too seriously, and I think died at a long, young age because he was just, I don't know, he thought too hard. And I don't know what he did. But anyway, he, was, he had the, uh, he was perhaps the first energy economist, and he uh, raised the alarm in Britain at the time that there was a finite supply of coal and that perhaps Britain could expect to run out of coal in around 1960, which was actually a pretty good forecast. And he said this, it's wholly a confusion of ideas to suppose that the economical use of fuel is equivalent to a diminished consumption. The very contrary is the truth. Every improvement of the steam engine, which in that case was what was relevant when affected, does but accelerate anew the consumption of coal. <laughs> 